and let's get started. So it amazes me the number of motors that come in for repair and the failure issues that they have that could have easily been prevented. We see this every day. To get a clear understanding of preventable, like all of us, I use Google. I threw that in there and I just wanted to throw that in there to keep from occurring, able to be avoided, avertable, correctable, healable, restorable, stoppable, curable, mendable, treatable. I'm here today to say that most causes of motor failures can be stopped in their tracks and are preventable. I know you're sitting there going, this guy's probably nuts. And I am a little bit because I'm born of that guy over there. But uh, my background has been in rebuilding and redesigning and improving motors for over 37 years. I have an electrical engineering background. We see the end result of motors being abused or neglected and not maintained. So we see the end result. Yes, there are some unpreventable failures like motor windings do age with time like everything else and they eventually fail. Rotor bars will eventually crack. All bearings have a calculated lifespan and motors are sized incorrectly so there's other factors that will impact the life of a motor but eventually should mean 15, 20, 25 years, not what we've all come to ex accept as short life, maybe five, 10 or less. Now we're gonna dive into the winding. What, what uh, I did again, as I said, I'm gonna talk about the two biggest areas. Well, the next major category is stator winding and some of this external. So um, we're gonna dive into that and those combined sometimes can make that 16% go up into the 20, 25, or 30%. So we'll talk about the external influencing factors. Winding failures are caused by one or a combination of the following stresses, thermal, electrical, mechanical, and environmental. So the lifespan of a motor is inversely proportional to temperature. So the hotter you let the motor run over its design limits, the shorter the life's gonna be. This graph here shows a motor, and, and, and there's a way of calculating this, but a motor that has 150 degree C uh, temperature will have about 30,000 hours of life. If you were able to somehow drop that temperature 10 degrees to 140, you actually double the lifespan of the motor. So it's really important to remember these types of things. It works in the reverse of that too. If you increase the temperature 10 degrees, you cut the life in half. So thermal stresses are caused by thermal aging, oxidation, <clears throat> insulation, molecular changes, moisture reactions, chemical breakdown, continuation of other stresses, dielectric, mechanical, environmental, overloading, operating the motor over its design limits causes the temperature to rise and it works out approximately as the square of the load and we'll give an example. Um, voltage variation, under over voltage condition will lead to thermal stresses. Everything increases the temperature. Voltage unbalance between phases, a really terrible condition for a motor, generates unbalanced currents in the winding and causes more heat. So we'll talk a little more about that, but here's an example of that alone. A 3% voltage imbalance will cause an 18% increase in temperature. And you're thinking 3% doesn't sound like that much, but what it does, is that 3% that unbalance causes an even greater current unbalance between phases and that's what's generating the heat. With that unbalance, you, that motor can only be operated if you want, want it to be at the same temperature at 90% of its rating. So NEMA recommends about 1% uh, and that is achievable with you know, decent power systems and supplies today. <clears throat> but the current imbalance will be six to 10 times the voltage imbalance. And the current imbalance is what's actually causing the heat. So ambient conditions, most of the time, the ambient surrounding the motor is generated by the heating and cooling area around the motor. So you've got the motor, but you have other heat sources that impact the motor, the bearing temperatures and lubrication system, the running the motor in a confined space, without proper ventilation, poor positioning of air vent openings such as weather protected motors, coupling of belt losses and heat from the driven equipment. All of this stuff combining 
to increase what we think is just maybe an outdoor ambient temperature to a higher temperature. Um, thermal stresses, load cycling, starting and stopping. The hardest condition on a motor is the starting of a motor if it's across the line. So uh, that will create a tremendous amount of heat because of that inrush current five to eight times. Repeated starts in a short period of time will rapidly uh, increase the temperature. The driven equipment or load impacts the starting time. The number of acceptable starts, stalls obviously greatly impact. All of these things go on. And uh, I've got a little video here. The point that I'm trying to make with this funny video that's not working is it's amazing the number of operators that um, will repeatedly start motors when a motor sh shuts down and then they'll just automatically repeatedly start it. And what the video was going to show you was just a funny th uh, video of somebody turning on and off something too many times until it blows up. That actually happens with motors. Motors are generally designed to have two cold starts. So if a motor's setting there in the morning and you're getting ready to start it, you could start it up. And then if you have to shut it down, you can shut it down and restart it. But generally speaking, most designs, you're gonna need a half hour to an hour of allowing it to cool because of the things that I'm talking about here. Because there's so much heat generated internally. Not too many people do that, but that's what you should be doing. If a motor's hot and it's running, you can shut down and restart, but that's it. Otherwise, you are gonna start generating additional heat in the motor and you'll cause damage. Uh, and in particular, you'll cause rotor issues. So the heat generating the motor uh, is dissipated by conduction, convection, and radiation. If the ventilation is blocked or plugged, it stops the motor from properly cool cooling, increasing the heat. Rule of thumb, like we've already said, for every 10 degrees C rise, you cut the insulation life in half. So the failure, types of failures in a winding, potential failure modes, turn to turn, coil to coil, phase to phase, coil to ground, open circuit for Y or delta. Those are the same or a combination of those. Uh, electrical stress causes insulation and dielectric aging. Like all things, windings age with time, running or not, but particularly running. The insulation has a predetermined life cycle. The electrical stresses are extreme, then the insulation breakdown occurs. Inadequate insulation, poor designs where minimum insulation is used, poor blocking or bracing, allowing movement and ultimate insulation failure. And another type of electrical stress, partial discharge. Um, partial discharge are small electric sparks that occur in the air pockets or voids in the insulation system or on the contaminated surface. Hard to see with this picture, but these sparks contain electrons and ions and they bombard the insulation to the point where this organic insulation, it'll actually degrade it and pit a hole right through it. Um, with enough time, it'll, it'll pop a hole through the ground wall. Uh, 40 thousandths internal air void will allow PD to occur. And we're gonna talk a little more about this, but the goal is to, if you're, it, which is common today, using vacuum pressure impregnation, VPI, is to have all those voids filled and then that PD activity wouldn't occur because there wouldn't be a void. So breakdown voltage for common insulating materials, air, 120 volt per mil, jump down to uh, mica, 20,000 volts per mil. Why mica is a preferred uh, insulating material, especially in higher voltages. Um, and it's also a very good, in my opinion, one of the best uh, protection for partial discharge. Electric breakdown strength of air, 120 volt per mil. When this voltage is exceeded, that spark or that PD will occur. You have conditions like external PD. Um, what, what you have on the right, and it's hard to see, but the coils are really close together without any spacing, but there's an air gap there and it allows uh, surface partial discharge activity. You have a surge ring here and you're getting this white dusting going on, that's PD activity. And then you have the, the condition over here, what I call PD etching. We've run into this a few times. This is on a 4,000 volt machine. Normally you don't expect to see PD activity that damages anywhere from 6,000 volts and up. Well, you can get it even at lower voltages. It's actually occurring, but it's more damaging the higher the voltage. So in this case, we, uh, 
This thing came in just for a general cleanup and the winding was completely covered so you couldn't see any of this. And fortunately, our guy that cleaned it noticed it, pointed it out to us, and uh, we saw this condition. This was literally from the outside in eating away the insulation. Now, what we found, we had sample of the contamination sent out and it was conductive and maybe a little acidic. It wasn't like acid, but acidic, but the combination of the partial discharge effect with that made this uh, winding start to, to eat away the insulation. And the problem and why that got worse is the customer left it in too long. They left it in service too long and they should be cleaning these more regularly because then you can retreat them with varnish or resin to stop this kind of activity. So talking about transient voltages, a change in voltage, unexpected change, like a spike, a rapid bus transfer, opening, closing circuit breakers. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see a lot of this because the utilities that we work with, most of the motors are across the line. So they're slamming the motor across the line. So it gets really important that you have all three phases of that breaker closing at the same time. The one on the left that's kind of cut off, that was actually lightning damage on an 8,000 horsepower, 4,000 volt machine, clear lightning damage. The one on the right is un uneven circuit breaker closure, we ultimately found, but it, there's tremendous amount of force created when you have an uneven closure between phases and it just causes a humongous amount of force. That particular coil was a line lead coil, so it was seeing the biggest uh, voltage spike. So coil movement, you can have just poor blocking or bracing. On this machine, you'll notice there's only felt here, there's nothing anywhere else. So whoever wound this probably should have had some felt right here and maybe one right about here and a surge rope. And this machine didn't have that. Um, just this one's pretty obvious. When a bearing fails, the rotor will drag the stator and it causes lamination damage and will cause it to go to ground. So environmental stressor contamination, moisture, a common problem from washdowns, water leaking, excess humidity, condensation, flooding of motors, abrasion, interior uh, damage can result from abrasive particles like fly ash and sand, cement dust, poor ventilation, block vent ducts, contamination will result in the motor running at higher temperatures. It's not allowing the motor to cool properly. Chemical fly ash is not only abrasive, but it is also conductive and then carbon black all of these are kind of obvious, highly conductive. They can attack the insulation. So just some quick environmental stress pictures. This is an abrasion on externally on the winding. A really obvious one, a paper mill, where they're plugging the, the, uh, the ribs on a totally enclosed fan cooled motor and it's really not cooling anymore. That's very common. Um, and when we see it, we tell the customer to try to break that stuff away so that the fan that you can't see underneath this housing is actually blown across those ribs. That's how it cools. But that's how you get shorter life in a motor. Um, blocking the uh, inlet screen or the inlet arrow to a motor, starving it of air. Partially blocked vent ducts when some of that material gets into the motor. You know, that example I showed, talked about earlier where they pull the the filter back, and then they allow that contaminated air to go into the motor, this will start to just completely plug these. This is just the beginnings. We get them in and they're completely plugged. If they're left in there long enough and that there's any moisture um, added to that and the, and the greases and oils or whatever else is in there, it'll actually create almost like a cement material where you can't even get the vents clean. And we've had cases where we've had to rewind a motor that was okay, but it had no cooling. So typical ground failures. This is a common area for a ground failure, depending on the blocking and bracing. When the motor starts, and we talked about earlier with the high end rush current, well, there's a tremendous amount of force being exerted on these end turns and the windings want to twist and turn. Blocking and bracing is really important. But if that isn't done properly, when the coil exits the slot, that's a fulcrum point. So it's a very common spot for a failure, depending on the insulation system and how it's blocked and braced. Other failures, single phase, kind of obvious. One phase out of three is gone. 
it will just slowly cook or bake the motor. Uh, turn to turn short on the end turn area. This one we identified as a line lead coil and we suspected a surge event. So summary of winding failures, the purpose of the failure is to try and understand how and why the winding failed, what were the primary causes and what can be learned, failure location, does it steer you toward the actual cause, contributing factors, high low voltages, excess loading, all those things that I asked earlier with the questions, do, does that contribute to the failure? There are many tools available today, just briefly vibration analysis, thermography, periodic, electrical insulation resistance or to ground or polarization index, surge comparison, other tests that include capacitance and ductance measurements. All of these are great tools. Partial discharge, power factor tests, those are used for like identifying the amount of contaminant on the outside of the winding. Typically used at higher voltages. It started at like 13.2, 13A. Now they're using them in 7,000 volt systems and they're even starting to use them in 4,000 volt machines. When the cause of failure is known and improvements can be made to provide a more robust or better insulated winding coil design, this can support preventing the repeat failure. So we're gonna dig in a little bit into understanding the original coil design. When you strip the winding, just briefly, I don't go into any detail, but core testing, making sure you don't have shorted laminations or something causing uh, heat that is causing the failure, kind of a separate issue, but it can cause. Obtaining accurate data through measurements and cross checks and then verifying the winding data through database checks and engineering checks. Evaluating specific design parameters like volts per mil, um, volts per turn, sizing the coil to the slot. Is there opportunity in there to, to increase insulation or something? Improving the state or I squared R losses by increasing copper. So we'll go into this a little bit more, but once the failure is understood, reviewing the original coil design will lead you to potential ways of improving the coil and preventing the failure. That's something my dad burrowed in our heads as we got brought into this business. Always figure out where the failure is and then how do we make it better. So after the winding data is obtained and you, you identify the physical geometry and what space, you identify what improvement opportunities you might have to be able to uh, improve the winding. One of them is increasing the copper cross-sectional area. In the older design machines, you can get upwards of 20%, and if you can do that, you're actually increasing the efficiency by a half a percent, and you're making that motor run cooler. So we always evaluate if we can get more copper in the slot. But sometimes you have to compromise. Sometimes you might have to increase ground wall or turn insulation over increasing the copper. So those things are looked at. Increasing the turn insulation. On almost every utility or across the line start or variable frequency drive, we will increase turn insulation if space allows because it adds that added protection. It's going to make the motor last a little longer. Increasing the ground wall uh, by increasing the thickness of the ground wall, which decreases the volts per mil. Um, add blocking and bracing. You know, we saw that winding. In this case, I'm showing a winding where we're using a surge rope that's getting tied in. There's felt blocks on the bottom side of the coil. They're not finished, but when they finish, they added two more rows of felt blocks and they tied them in. All of this adds for a very rigid winding. Um, taping the coil leads with mica versus sleeving. We found as we get into higher voltages and in and, and our company, 4,000 volt and up, we only have taped mica leads. Um, so what can you do to improve a coil winding? With every unique coil design, one or more of these improvements can be implemented, implemented with great success. The engineer and coil supplier focus on the highest problem areas and design and improve these while sometimes having a compromise. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, do you put more copper in or do you add more turn insulation? Depending on what the failure was, you might steer toward more turn insulation and not more copper, or maybe only 5% more copper, and you could still increase turn insulation. 